Uh, good morning all. So in this video, I want to go through an article that someone in the Facebook group alerted me to today about uh, some changes coming up to the selective school test. So it's in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, July 31st, and the title is Selective School Tests Go Digital in Biggest Shake-Up in 30 Years. All right, and the article is uh, written by Jordan Baker, who somewhat ironically went to a selective high school. She went to North Sydney Girls High School. I, I should point out I also went to a selective high school. I went to Fort Street High School. And before I went to Fort Street High School, I went to Summer Hill OC. So yeah, I am a sort of a beneficiary of the uh, selective school and OC class programs. All right, so let's go through the article because I have a few, few thoughts on them. And I'll also have a look at uh, another document that outlines some of the government's plans for selective schooling in the future. Right, selective school entry exams will move online in their biggest overhaul in decades, with the job of writing and delivery changing hands for the first time since the test began more than 30 years ago. In a move that has shaken the private coaching industry, so this seems to be a big one in these articles, they always seem to be after uh, the private coaching industry, the tutoring uh, centres, the coaching colleges. The opportunity class and selective school contract was stripped from the long-time local provider by British company Cambridge Assessment in a 5.5 million five-year deal. That includes providing digital tests. All right, and then we have a uh, picture. The selective school entry test will go digital as part of its biggest change in 30 years. The opportunity class test sat by year four students will be online from next year, next year going online and the selective high school test sat in year six will go online in 2022. It is the intention to process and deliver results earlier. A spokesman, and an unnamed spokesman, of course, for the New South Wales Department of Education said. Cambridge assessment founded by the university, uh, well, even those universities there, uh, Cambridge and Oxford and, and so forth, their reputations are not as great as they once were, will now write its own version of the test but will subcontract delivery to Australian digital assessment specialist Jamison, which already provides an online platform for Best Start Year 7, and VALID, I uh, wonder what that acronym stands for, science tests for the department. A lot of time seems to be spent on making up these clever acronyms, right? Yeah, I'd love to know what it stands for. I'll look it up later. Right, the decision comes after a 2018 department review found the selective school entrance exams were too easy. Right, that's a very interesting choice of words. All right, so because this article is in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, it's particularly interesting because I uh, used to regularly go on a forum run by the Sydney Morning Herald called the SMH Student Forum. A uh, few other members of the group were also uh, inhabitants of that group. And wow, the general feeling on that group was that selective schools are horrible. You know, they're so unfair, so inequitable that we must get rid of them. You know, if you ever said anything good about selective schools, you were, you know, branded an elitist, a snob. So, um, and another interesting thing is that you got many parents there saying that exams like NAPLAN were too hard. Too difficult, right? Too difficult for kids. No point making them do NAPLAN tests. Now, most of you getting ready for a selective school and OC would disagree with that. You would say, ah, oh, NAPLAN's a pretty easy test. You know, most children do pretty well in it. Uh, I've had students that I, I didn't think were that great and they're still getting very good results in NAPLAN. So it seems odd to say on the one hand that NAPLAN is too hard, right? And celebrate when that test is scrapped this year due to the COVID pand pandemic. And then to say uh, selective school exams were too easy, right? When your average student who struggled in NAPLAN, oh, they're really gonna do badly in selective. So, so there's a real sort of sub subjectivity about this statement. Too easy for whom, all right? Like too easy for really smart kids? Yeah, maybe, maybe but uh, certainly not too easy for the general population. All right, so favoring students who had done lots of practice tests 
and making it hard to differentiate between bright and very bright students. All right, so, so seemingly they don't want just bright students there who worked hard. They don't want that. They want very bright students, very bright students who might be lazy, right? Who might not want to study. Now, to me, this whole thinking is, it's, it's really strange because, um, all right, the way the selective test has been for so long, it's been very similar to an IQ test in a way, right? That they use those pattern recognition problems. And so a very bright student shouldn't have any problem recognizing it. But I think because a lot of people who, you know, they think their child is really smart and they do the test and they don't get in, they then have to find a scapegoat and it's usually the, you know, the people who spent money on practicing for the test. They don't want to entertain the thought that that child might still have got in anyway. All right, the selective school tests have been run by the Australian Council for Educational Research, yeah, that's ASA, since they began in 1988. All right, this is really interesting. I might know something here that Jordan Baker doesn't know. I think I'm a little bit older than Jordan Baker. So I went to a selective school I was going before 1988. I started at Fort Street before 1988. And I definitely remember doing an exam to get in. So uh, this claim just seems to be complete fabrication, completely made up. I did an exam to get into selective before 1988. I can even remember the day we did it in, in uh, our OC class. You know, the whole class did it. You know, and I had friends at other primary schools who did it because a uh, few of my friends from my previous primary school, they got in to uh, Fort Street as well. And even to get in OC, to OC, which is even further back than 88, I remember doing the exam to get in. I was the only one from my primary school to, to get into OC. Right? It was uh, much harder then. It was a very limited uh, number of schools and spots. So I'd say from my previous primary school, Petersham Public School, I'd say about 10 kids from my year went on to go to Fort Street, but I was the only one to get into OC. So it's a roughly equivalent to today in uh, you know how it's much harder to get into OC than it is selective. So yeah, that claim makes me think, yeah, again, journalists, they don't really know what they're talking about. Right. This council dominates the local assessment market and runs scholarship tests for schools such as the Scots College. I've had a few students get full scholarships at Scots. And sure, yeah, so the exams are, uh, must be fairly similar to the selective ones. As competition for spots in selective schools has increased, the coaching industry has flourished, promising to prepare students for the entrance exams. Tutoring colleges invested heavily in developing practice tests based on students' recollections of the real tests. Yeah, there's some truth to that. I don't do that, but I've heard uh, students tell me that other tutoring centres get children to try and remember one question each from the exam and uh, to tell the, the tutoring centre that question so they can model their tests around it. Uh, to be honest, I don't do that. I don't really give the practice tests. All right. And another thing this article doesn't consider is that if they change the tests, to something of a more psychometric nature, which is you know measuring true intelligence and so on. And my good students that get scholarships and get into James Bruce and so on, oh, they're still gonna get in, right? I can tell within meeting a child uh, within a couple of hours, you know, how, how gifted they are, how smart they are, you know, how they, how they view the world. All right, so which are not released. In a statement to the Australian Stock Exchange upon winning the contract in May, Janison said it would help Cambridge deliver tests, which will run digitally for the very first time. Digital question types will allow the examiners to set more intricate difficulty levels, which better benchmark a broader range of skills among high performing students. So here you can see this is all sort of um, subversive talk, I think, for changing the demographic of the students who get into selective, right? They're saying, well, this current test is resulting in us getting all the same types of students. Let's look at a broader range of skills. Uh, its platform allowed for a seamless test, regardless of a school's connectivity, and could incorporate state-of-the-art assessment strategies. Yeah, who even knows what that means, right? You say something is state-of-the-art and it's good, right? This is sort of tied into a lot of uh, political jargon 
of today where you say, ah, oh, everything old, that was rubbish, right? Let's bring in something new, state of the art. Right? And you might bring in this state of the art assessment strategy and it might change nothing. That's actually my thesis. I don't think it'll change much in terms of the students that get in. Anyway, as well as deeper analysis of results, the company statement said, gifted education expert Rosalind Walsh said digital tests had advantages such as the capacity to include animation, videos, and graphics in questions. You can move well beyond five multiple choice answers, she said. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly a fan of multiple choice answers to begin with. I wouldn't mind if they moved the questions to completely free form. It made the test easier to adapt for children with disabilities. This is a big one. All right, this is what they want. They want more equity. Uh, as more and more children today are having learning disabilities such as dyslexia, ADHD, autism. Uh, they want to make the test easier for those children. They'll say, oh, the test is wrong. You know, it's not uh, the student's fault that they can't sit still for five minutes. It's uh, the test's fault. So, and possibly they'll even make that a criteria. They'll be like, oh, you know, he wants to run around every minute. Yeah, give him extra marks for that and could also help students catch mistakes, such as when you're copying the book into your answer, onto your answer sheet and your questions get out of sync, she said. From a research perspective, digital tests could provide information, such as whether students were guessing, they answer questions quickly, right? Why does, <laughs> just because you answer quickly means you're guessing, right? Wow, that's a, that's a strange position to take. You might just be smart, possibly, yeah? Hover on the correct answer, then choose the wrong one. So what, are they actually going to give the mark to someone who hovers on the correct answer and then chooses the wrong one? They're going to say, they, oh, they got nervous or something, or get stuck on certain types of questions. All right, well, that'd be good information. It would tell you what type of thinker you are. But Dr. Walsh said it was difficult to tell whether the new test would be significantly different from the old one. There are things that will probably stay the same because they are the way we have been measuring general ability for a very long time. She said, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, IQ tests have been the, the same way for a long time. Taryn Carner, who runs a website selling practice sites, said the industry would be taken by surprise by the changes. First thing parents are going to do is call me and ask if I'm on board, and I'll say not really because we don't know what's coming, he said. It shouldn't hurt me too much, but it will definitely hurt some of the tutoring colleges. The head of another company said, oh, you need a space between company and said there. He had noticed changes in the test. Yeah, good editing by the Sydney Morning Herald. He had noticed changes in the test since the 2018 review, such as fewer maths questions in the general ability assessment. Yeah, that's something that is pointed out in the review. They think girls are not as good at maths. So they're trying to put less maths in, in these exams to help more girls get in. Uh, head of the Secondary Princi Principals Council, Craig Peterson, said many assessments were moving online. However, he hoped the department could ensure equity. That's the key word, equity. All right. That's, that's the word you're going to hear everywhere. Equity of access. It's equity is what they want. All right. They don't want high achievers and they don't want people working hard for success. They want equity of access to technology. So some students were not advantaged by having better quality equipment. About 14,000 students sat the 2020 selective school tests in March. This year's opportunity class had been delayed until September. 2018 review found the selective school test was too easy. That's yeah, a really weird statement. High scores could be achieved by correctly answering moderately difficult questions with great consistency. There's so many adjectives in here, you know, to and add a moderately adverb, difficult adjective. What does difficult mean? Uh, great. As soon as you see a statement with so many subjective terms in it, you know it's just rubbish. Or it's just someone making something up, which can result from preparation and practice. Yeah, preparation and practice are now bad things. Right? In any other field, you would say they were good. Like if you were a musician, you'd say, oh, you have to practice hard to become good at it. If you're an athlete, same thing. You would train a lot. You know, If you're a swimmer or a, you know a a gymnast, you will have to practice a lot. You're not just naturally going to be better than everyone else at it. But for some reason in education, there's this real push to say preparation and practice are bad. 
the review found. This makes it difficult to differentiate between students of very high ability who would be able to answer correctly questions of higher difficulty and those with high ability who are proficient at test taking. So we can see um, there's a sort of a paradox going on here. Uh, this seems to be a true elitism. They want to get rid of students with high ability who practice and replace them with students of very high ability who just don't even need to bother practicing. And uh, so I guess that would result in uh, only having genius people get into selective. No, no point in even studying anymore. All right, Angelo Gabriel, Gabrielatos, president of the New South Wales Teachers Federation, said he was concerned at the growth of private education businesses. This is another example of the department outsourcing its function with and entering into opaque contracts. Great word there, opaque. It's like what I've been talking about uh, today. It's not transparent. It's not clear what's going on, right? Like uh, these companies who talk about having their state of the art. And hey, you see there's even a link to an article about tiger mums, right? Which shows you how unpopular the sort of Asian view towards education has become. In Australia. Um, yeah, it's not clear what these companies, when they say they run state-of-the-art uh, assessments and exams, what they actually mean by that. All right, so this article is very, very disturbing because I'll just go now to uh, the PDF document. So this is from the Department of Education from the end of 2018. It's their uh, review of selective education access. And I've already looked through this with my students when it came out. All right, so they identified some problems. Fewer applications from educationally disadvantaged students. All right, a big one here is uh, Aboriginal students. All right, they want to get more uh, Aboriginal students into the schools. Not all gifted students are aware of the test, yeah. Well, when I did it, my teachers uh, told me about it to do OC. Yeah, my parents didn't know it exists. So you would assume every teacher should know about it. Um, the OC test. All right, as we go on, new test design from 2020, so that's this year. So yeah, they're trying to change it a little bit. Um, students from disadvantaged groups, there's that big word again, disadvantaged. All right, encourage more gifted students from underrepresented groups. What that means, I read that to mean is groups other than Asian people, all right? They even mention Asian people by name. Later on, I'll go down here, all right? So um, equity, equitable, it's everywhere in this document. Uh, must be updated, need, needs of tomorrow. Uh, just go down a little bit. Close the gender gap, you see, they're very, very high on uh, closing the gender gap. Apparently boys are too, too uh, advantaged. Reduce coachability, yeah, they're very uh, big uh, in their animosity towards coachability. All right, a uh, lot of statistics in here. A lot of, uh, they even talk about wealth, all right? They talk about how the students who go to tutoring tend to be wealthy. Right, so and that's not fair to the, the poor students. Yeah, a lot of talk about Aboriginal students. A lot of this is driven by politics. Uh, underrepresented groups, that'll again be Aboriginal groups. Here we go in this section. So encouraging students from a wide variety of backgrounds to apply. I was shocked when I read this that they actually pointed out. So. The students from some language group, that figure was very much higher, including Eastern Asian, Southern Asian, Southeast Asian. So um, imagine if you said that about some other group, just saying there's too many of them, 70%, 61, 37, too many, need to get more students. So it seems very much as though, uh, and yeah, they talk about rural areas. Um, the rural areas argument is all quite ridiculous because um, the marks to get into the uh, OC classes and selective classes out there are so low. Uh, any student, I've never had a student get a mark uh, that they wouldn't qualify to get in. All right, so here's some talk about getting in. Minimizing precision. 
Uh, da da da. Yeah, too much uh, maths. They think too much maths. That's leading to the gender gap, right? So they're basically saying that girls are not good at maths. Got to put more English in there to help the girls. Yeah, when we've already scrapped maths as being mandatory in the uh, HSC. Reduce predictability and coachability. All right, so yeah, they're thinking the kids who go to tutoring, they get too much of an advantage because they, they can predict what's going to happen. All right, which again is rubbish. I mean, I teach so much vocabulary and you still hear about words in the test that they've never come across that they would have to uh, guess at. Uh, revised, uh, yeah, here's the gender gap opportunity, uh, statistics. So, uh, well, it looks very close to me in terms of OC, selective, yeah, small gap, not, not a great gap. Talk about co-ed, selective schools, etc. Partner with schools, yep, yeah, da -da. research fellow. Uh, this is where they say how they came across it, what they were able to figure out, and the people who did it, right? Which was uh, a couple, some professors who probably got paid quite well to to undertake this work. All right, I'll just do a, a search. I'll look for uh, the word equity. We'll see how many times we find it. All right, equity, 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 equity. Yeah, it's, equity is the word. Uh, so what is really big in society at the moment is uh, they want equal representation. So basically what they would want is if you had a population that's 50% boys and 50% girls, They'd want the same number in selective school. And they'd also want it that if you have, say, 5% uh, Chinese people, they'll only want 5% of selective students to be Chinese. So you can see this is very uh, dangerous because it, it's going against the idea of a meritocracy, which means that the best person gains the position. So the, what they're trying to do is achieve equality of outcome, All right? So I'm going to be teaching about this again, this article uh, with my students this week, because uh, you know I was going to do something else, but because I don't teach uh, towards the test, I'm actually telling my students about all this stuff that society is in a real state of flux and it's turning against uh, these sort of high achiever people who seem like elitists, right? Like I'm in other groups, learning disability groups. For example, where our oh, people, they're, they're not happy with those children that do well on tests. They say it's not fair, you know, to, to my child who is also brilliant, but for some reason can't read, right? But they're still brilliant in their language because there's this growing belief that um, everyone has to be seen as brilliant, right? No matter what. And for, because everyone goes to school, that makes it really difficult. To, to have these selective schools exist. Because basically, if you don't get into it, then it seems you might not be brilliant, right? And that's that's where the cognitive dissonance comes into it. All right, anyway, I'm sorry, I apologize for the length of this video. It was a lot to cover. I'd really be keen to hear some of your thoughts on this.